right? Good morning. Can you all hear me? Also from the back. Yeah. Good. So, welcome to the last class of our ergodic theory course. So, today we are going to put together what we learned from Stefano's class and Lucia's class. And, well, in the background, we've heard from the first two classes, and we're going to discuss Birkhoff ergodic theorem, which is kind of the starting point, well, one of the fundamental results in ergodic theory. So before doing that, let me start by recalling a result we've seen in the uh, second class of Corinna's course, which is this theorem, which was due to Weil. that says that uh, you fix an irrational number alpha, and then for any continuous function f on the circle, and uh, for any x, circle, then um, if you take the average up to time n of the values of the function f along the orbit of the point x by the rational rotation by alpha, and if you take n larger and larger, well, this in the limit uh, converges to the integral of f. Uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So by lambda, I'm denoting the Lebesgue measure. And here, let me stress that this holds for any point. So the picture you should have in mind, again, is uh, is uh, the circle zero, 01. Then you pick, you fix a continuous function f. And then you can pick any initial condition x. And you can look at the orbit of x up to time n, so a long segment of the orbit, so this is x, say this is r alpha of x, this is r square alpha of x, and so on, and you look at the values of the function along the orbit, and you average all these points you get, and if you take a longer and longer segment of the orbit, well, what you see in the end is the integral of f. Is this clear? This we've seen already. So yeah, please stop if you have uh, stop me if you have any question and don't be afraid to ask. And uh, let me add something else that wasn't stated explicitly, but if you look uh, back uh, to the proof of the theorem, uh, should be clear. Is that uh, more precisely? Uh, not only this convergence holds for any point in X, but is also uniform in X. So uh, the sequence of function uh, let me denote a n of f at the point, and this is just the average up to time n. composed with r alpha to the k of x. This, sequence of fun this is a sequence of continuous function on the circle, and this converges uniformly. Uh, to the integral of f. And uh, hopefully we'll see, I'll come back to this part later in this class. Anyhow, this is the kind of result we are aiming for. So we want to uh, do something similar, but in our setting of uh, ergodic theory. So in what is our setting? Well, uh, in this class, we have, as usual, x b mu, which is a probability space.
So by this I mean that uh, XP is a measure, measurable space and mu is a probability measure. And let me stress that it's really fundamental that the measure is finite. We've already seen a few times what goes wrong if you take an infinite measure. And uh, again, so this is a measure space, so a priori there is no topology whatsoever on X. So no continuous function, nothing. And then you look, consider a transformation T from X to X, and the only assumption you, you put on T is that it's measure preserving. This means that the push forward T star mu is equal to mu. And again, this map T as, well, there is no topology, so it's not continuous, it's just a measurable map which preserves the, this probability measure. So we want to kind of do the same thing. We have X, and we want to look at some function F from X to the real, and try to do something like this. But the first question is, what assumptions should I put on F? So in this theorem, we were looking at continuous functions, but here we have no topology, so we have no way of saying what a continuous function is. So the first question is, what is the good class of functions we want to look at? Well, if we are aiming for something like this and we want to take some integral, maybe we should ask at least for the function to be measurable and we want this integra the, the integral to be finite. So a natural assumption on the function is asking to be in L1 of mu. So is it clear what I mean by L1? So Lucia briefly define it at the end. So this is, the, this is actually a space of equivalence classes of functions which are integrable and the integral of the modulus is finite, and you say the two functions are equivalent if they coincide almost everywhere. Okay. So these are the assumptions you have. The probability space, a measure preserving transformation, and a L1 function. And you want to pick a point X in your space, follow the orbit, so here you have T of X, here you have square of x and so on. And you want to look at the average of the values of the function along this orbit. And the question is, uh, do these averages uh, and let me call them again a n of f in 1 over n of x do, this average, do the averages converge? And I mean, what does it mean converge? So in which sense do they converge if they do? So do they converge pointwise? Do they converge in some norm? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't make much, much sense to ask them uh, to converge everywhere because f is an equivalence class of functions. So if I change the values of f along a, on a zero measure set, uh, this is the same function in L1. So it doesn't make much sense to ask for these averages to converge everywhere, right? Um, so in which sense do they converge? And this question is answered by the protagonist of this lecture, which is birkhoff ergodi theorem. But before that, uh, just a notation. Uh, so I've already defined this a n of f, and these are called Birkhoff averages. Averages. And uh, if I denote s n of f, by this I mean uh, just the sum without taking, without dividing by n. So this is n minus 1 of f composed with tk of x. And these are called Birkhoff sums. I'm just, I think Corinna will use them, so um, I'm just fixing notation. Birkhoff sums. Okay. So what is the result? Well, 
Uh, Stefan already briefly mentioned part of it during his lecture, so this is Gurkhoff ergodic theorem. Am I missing a name? Yeah. So what is the statement? Well, you, again, you fix a probability space. And you fix a measure-preserving transformation using the same notation as Lucia. So MPT is a measure-preserving transformation. Then for all F, the conclusion is that for all f in L1 of a, or L1 of mu and for mu almost every x, this average converge a n f of x. Uh, maybe I should say the limit. the limit of the Birkhoff averages exist. And this is what Stefan already mentioned. So let me call this f bar of x where this limit exists. So the statement is also that the function F bar is actually a function in L1, so it's integrable. And is T invariant. So this function is in L1, is T invariant, and the integral of this function is the same as the integral of your starting function. The integral of F bar with respect to the mu is equal to the integral of f with respect to the mu. Is the statement clear? So the averages converge for mu almost every x. So why is this theorem called the ergodic theorem if there is no notion of ergodicity? Well, there is an easy corollary. which might be the form you've seen before, uh, with the assumption above if T is also ergodic, with respect to mu, um, then or you can actually say what this limit is. Then for mu almost every x in x, uh, you have that the limit of the Birkhoff averages, and let me just rewrite it, from 0 to n minus 1 of f along the orbit. This is actually the integral of f respect to the invariant measure, invariant ergodic measure. Okay, let's prove this corollary, but it's actually an easy exercise. Well, you just apply the theorem that tells you that for mu almost every point, this limit exists. So f bar, which, uh, with the notation is this limit where it exists, is, an, is a invariant function. So by ergodicity, what happens by ergodicity? It's constant. 
f bar of x is equal to a constant mu almost everywhere. So now I just have to convince you that this constant is actually the integral of f. Well, but the integral of f with respect to the mu, by, also by this the statement of the theorem, is the same as the integral of f bar. But f bar is a constant, so this integral is just constant times the measure of the space, and x is a probability space, so this is one. Is this clear? So I guess it was never stated explicitly, but uh, what do we mean by mu almost every x? We mean that there exists a set with full measure on which this statement holds for every point. Do you want me to write it down or? Okay, maybe I'll write it. So maybe we can put it as a remark. So mu almost every means uh, that there exists a set uh, y uh, such that the measure of y is one, so it has full measure, uh, such that for all uh, y in y, the conclusion holds, right? So whenever we say mu almost everywhere or almost surely, we always mean that there exists a set of full measures where this happens or on the opposite. The set where this property fails has zero measure. So, um, so here there is, uh, this is a statement about measure preserving transformation, but uh, all the examples we've seen, uh, usually you had a topological space and you had a continuous map. And we've seen that for continuous map on topological spaces, the compact topological spaces, there always exists an invariant measure, but maybe there are many of them. So let's think about what happens if we change. So this statement holds for every mu measure, so Stefan already mentioned that, but what happens if we take the same topological dynamical system, but we consider different invariant measures? So the limit exists, maybe let's take two ergodic uh, invariant measure, so the, the term on the right changes, right? Because if you change the measure, a priori the integral of f changes. So something on the left has to change as well. W what, what changes on the left? What is the part on the left that depends on the measure? Actually, there are two parts on the left that depend on the measure. The point x, so if, so, if, a state, if this statement holds for this x for a measure, maybe this x is not a good x for another ergodic measure, and actually it's not, okay? But there's also another part that changes with the measure. It's not just the point. The transformation, maybe you can take the same, but the other thing that changes is the function. So remember that the assumption is that the function is in L1 of mu, so it's integrable with respect to mu. And if you change the measure, the same function might be integrable for a measure, but not integrable for another measure. So, well, I haven't put this in the exercise, but maybe you can think uh, a few minutes of taking a continuous uh, dynamical system, maybe one of the ones we already seen, and take two ergodic measures and find the function which is in L1 of one but not in L1 of the other. So it's integrable with respect to one but not with respect to the other. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how to state this remark but be careful about which measures you are considering, okay. And um, yeah, and the last remark is that uh, I haven't stated but Part of the theorem is also that the same convergence holds also in L1. So 
uh, the convergence. So the, the statement is for mu almost everywhere, so it's a pointwise almost everywhere convergence, but it com the sequence of the, aver the Birkhoff averages converges also in the L1 norm. Is also in the L1 norm, which Lucia defined uh, last time. Okay, I should speed up a little bit. Yes? Um, so, if the measure is not ergodic, uh, this is not uh, very precise what I'm about to say, but uh, if the measure is not ergodic, the function you get here is a function which is, uh, so if ergodicity means that the system is uh, in the composable in, from the measure theoretic point of view. So if the system is not ergodic, it means that you can decompose it in different uh, measure preserving system with positive measure. And you can think of, let me draw a picture, but uh, this is not precise, so maybe your system can be split into several uh, invariant pieces, and what this function is, is the average of this function, but just on these separate pieces. So when you average averages, you get the same average, right? Does it make sense what I'm saying? This is very vague, but uh, you would have to make this statement precise, and you can, but uh, it would take more than an hour. So. But anyway, you should think of this uh, limit as the average on the minimal invariant uh, subset of subsystem of your space. And then when you average of these averages, you get the same average. But also you can think that, um, so the integral of f composed with t is the same as the integral of f because t is measure preserving. So the integral of an of f is the same of the integral of f for every f. So the statement is just basic. This last part of the statement is I can exchange the integral and the limit, which you can't always do, but yeah. Okay, uh, some applications. So let's take a number in zero one and let's write it down in its decimal expansion. So x is not point um, x zero, x one, x one, two, and so on. So this is the decimal expansion. So by this I mean that x can be written as an infinite sum of uh, xi divided by 10 to the i, where xi is a digit uh, between zero and nine. So one thing you might wonder is how many times the same digit occurs in the decimal expansion of a number? And uh, what's the proportion of the digit two in the decimal expansion of a random number? And uh, the statement is that, uh, well, if you count the number of times, uh, say one less than k less than n, such that the digit i of x is uh, some fixed digit l between zero and nine, so many times this happened, divided by n, so what's the proportion that the digits the digit L occurs in the decimal expansion of X is that for Lebesgue, almost every point, well, this frequency tends to one tenth. So each digit occurs with the frequency you expect it to occur. So no digit is 
better than the other, basically. And uh, so, well, the statement is that this limit exists and is equal to one tenth. How do we prove this? Um, well, uh, if you take any number, for example, you first notice that x1, the first digit is equal to L, if and only if x belongs to the interval IL, which is L divided by 10, L plus 1 divided by 10. OK, well, first uh, we have an issue because maybe the decimal expansion is not unique, but uh, we've already seen is Hannah's course when an expansion in base 2 or 10 is not unique. Uh, and this happens for countably many points. So when we look for almost every, for a statement of almost every point, we it's okay, we don't worry too much about what happens in zero measure set. So let's suppose that this expansion is unique. So you can meditate the, um, this in connection to Anna's course. Well, this is kind of obvious. So define, consider the map E10 of X, which is just the multiplication by 10 mod one. So we learn in primary school that when we multiply by 10, we just uh, shift the dot to a different place, right? So then xk is equal to L if and only if e10 of k minus 1 of x, uh, the first digit of this number is equal to L. We've just shifted the k digit to the first place. And the first digit is equal to L if and only if it belongs to IL. So what is this number then? Well, the number of times up to N such that XK is equal to L. I I can just sum for k from 1 to n of uh, the characteristic function of the interval IL of e10 to the k minus 1 of x and divide by n. Right? And uh, for the sake of notation, let just me ship the indices. So here it was k minus 1 for k from 1 to n. So let me put from 0 to n minus 1. And here we put k. OK? Well, then we, we've seen, uh, well, it was one of the exercises of Lucia's class, it was for the Dublin map, but uh, I mean, okay, you can do for exercise for the time 10 map, but this map is ergodic with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So we can apply the corollary of, well, Birkhoff ergodic theorem in this form, and this tells you that this average converge for mu almost every point, for Lebesgue almost every point, so by Birkhoff theorem, a Birkhoff ergodic theorem for uh, this average converge to the integral of this function in the lambda for all x inside the set of measure 1. And let me call this set of measure 1 n, then l where the measure of n, l, 10 is equal to 1. 
Okay? There exists a set of full measures such that the Birkhoff averages converge to the integral of the function. But what, what is the integral of an indicator function? It's just a measure of the set. So this is just a Lebesgue measure of IL. And IL is this interval, so this is 1 over 10. So the set of points is 0, 1 for which the digit L as an asymptotic frequency as measure one, and this asymptotic frequency is 110. So the set of x in zero one, uh, which are normal and binormal, which are normal in base 10, and by normal in base 10, I mean that the frequency of the digit, of any digit from 0 to 9, occurs with frequency 1 tenth. Well, this set, n10, is just the intersection of all this nL. Right? You just do the same thing for all the digits from 0 to 9. All these sets have measure 1. So this set is measure one as well. So is this set which has measure one. Is this clear? Yes? No. I'll take it as a yes. If we have questions, ask. Okay, maybe in three minutes, let's do another example. Yes. A function is T invariant. So, oh, okay, let me put it here. F is T invariant if for mu almost every x uh, in x, f is equal to f composed with t. So f of x is equal to f composed with t. So the value of the function is the same along all the orbit of t. Uh, So, yes? So, yeah, sorry, I didn't write uh, too much. So, this uh, average, these averages have a limit by Birkhoff ergodic theorem for Lebesgue almost every point. And this means that there exists a point with a set of measure one such that. Uh, the con this limit exists and is equal to 110 for all the points in that set. And I'm just calling that set. And so by this n is an any letter, by this I mean you write, you write the number is in base 10 and you look at the frequency of the digit L. Just because the set of all normal numbers is just the intersection of all these sets for L, for all the digits from 0 to 9. Okay? Uh, so we can compute the same objects so the frequency at which some digit occurs, but maybe for the continued fraction expansion of a number. So A0, A1, dot, 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 this is the continuous fraction expansion of X. Of X. And you ask yourself, what is the frequency well, zero from k and minus one of how many times does the digit L appear in the continuous fraction expansion of a number? 
divide by n and you ask yourself, does this limit exist and what is it? Well, I, I'll go a bit faster if it's okay for everyone. And uh, the key point is just to remember that A0 is equal to L if and only if X belongs to the set, what do I have called it, uh, PL is one over um, L plus one, one over L. So remember that the connection with the Gauss map, here we have one half, one third, one fourth, and so on. One way of finding the continuous fraction expansion was you, de you denote this interval P1, this interval P2, and so on. And if a point lands here, well, the, the first digit of the continuous fraction expansion is one, right, and so on. So if it's here, it's two, etc. And the Gauss map acts on the set on the continuous fraction expansion as a shift on the left. We all remember this? Okay, so, well then, AK is equal to L, if and only if GK of X, where this is the Gauss map, belongs to PL. So you can conclude in the same way, and saying then, then, okay, I haven't said this, but, um, you, you haven't seen this. We have seen that the Gauss map, uh, the Lebesgue measure is invariant for the Gauss map, and let me state it as a fact. The Gauss map is ergodic, not the Lebesgue measure, sorry, the, with respect to the measure mu f, which is, um, the measure of which has density. So in Irene's notation, maybe I should have called it lambda f. In Irene's notation, when you do lambda f, this means that this is the measure which has density f with respect to lambda, where f was the function one over log two times one over x plus one. I don't remember if she did it in class or in an exercise, but at least we checked that this, uh, the Gauss map is, leaves this measure invariant, and as a fact, I'll tell you that it's also ergodic. And now, you can just apply the theorem I'm erasing. Uh, by Kirchhoff ergodic theorem, or mu f, lambda f, sorry, lambda f, almost every x in zero one, the frequency uh, zero. Divided by n, well this, for, uh, almost every x, this converges as we did for the base two expansions to the, in, to, yeah, to the integral of the characteristic function of PL with respect to this measure. But again, the integral of a characteristic function is nothing but the measure of uh, this interval. Okay, so maybe let me, so what is this measure? This is just uh, PL. This measure is the Lebesgue measure with density one over ln two times one over x plus one. Lebesgue measure. This is the definition. This is the definition of this. And this is just the integral 
from 1 divided by L plus 1 to 1 over L of this function. And, uh, if we remember from calculus, uh, I'll skip a few passages and I'll tell you that if you integrate these functions correctly, you get 1 over ln 2 times ln of uh, L plus 1 squared divided by L times L plus 2. And yeah, if you want to check, because maybe I got it wrong. I, Okay, so in the last 10 minutes, um, I want to talk about unique ergodicity. Do you have any question on this part? Okay. So let's go back to the setting where XD is a compact metric space. And T is a continuous map. So we've seen before um, with Stefano that uh, theorem, this was Krilov, Pokulju, Bov theorem, which Stefano told us about, that in this case, uh, there always exists mu, a Borel probability measure, uh, which is T invariant. But uh, we've seen uh, with Hannah that uh, maybe, well, more often than not, there are way more than just one probability measure. So for example, if you have a periodic orbit, then every periodic orbit supports an invariant measure. And for example, in the case of E2, there are, or in the case of expanding maps of degree two, the, dense, the set of periodic points is dense. So there are lots and lots of invariant measure. But now I want to consider the opposite case where there is just one invariant measure. So definition, we say that T is uniquely ergodic if there exists only one invariant probability measure. There exists only one T invariant probability measure. And uh, so again, you might ask, why is T called uniquely ergodic? If there is no ergodicity here, well, there is a proposition or theorem that tells you that if T is uniquely ergodic, then it's ergodic with respect to its only invariant probability measure. So if T is uniquely ergodic, then it's ergodic. It is ergodic with respect to its invariant measure. I'm not gonna prove this, but uh, last time, uh, yesterday, Lucia briefly mentioned that the set of all T invariant probability measure is a convex set and the extremal points are exactly the ergodic measure. So if your convex set is just a point, the extremal set is the point itself and so it's ergodic. This is the idea, but I'm not gonna do the details. On the other hand, I'm proving another characterization which 
should make a link with the first part of uh, this class that says, so for a con question, for a continuous map T from X to X, where X is compact metric space, uh, the following are equivalent. T is uh, uniquely ergodic. So, um, for every, so again, I'm in the setting of uh, topological spaces, so I can talk about continuous functions. So for every continuous function, uh, the Birkhoff averages converge to a constant C, depending only on the function and not on the point, constant, for all, for all X. And three, the same thing where the convergence is uniform. Um, how do I say it? Okay, maybe I should say the convergence is the convergence in part two is uniform across X. Across X. Okay, so this is a you can, you should think of Vi theorem we've seen before. So for example, this theorem also tells you that in the case of rotation, since we've already proved two, well, the Lebesgue measure is the only invariant measure for the rotation. This was not obvious, I guess. So, examples. Well, by via theorem, the rotation, an irrational rotation, uh, where alpha is irrational, is uniquely ergodic. You will see in the exercises, and this I think is a bit challenging, but, uh, uh, well, it would be, the statement would be precise in the exercise, but you should think of isometries are uniquely ergodic. Um, we will see next week probably that interval exchange transformation that Corinna briefly mentioned are typically, and this typically I think will be precise next week, uniquely ergodic. But on the other hand, expanding maps of the circle, X maps of S1, the protagonists of Hannah's course are not uniquely ergodic. And again, the reason is simply that, uh, for example, as soon as you have periodic orbits, fixed points, well, each of those carry an invariant measure, so there are usually more than one. And this is always the case. For Fastly chaotic systems, they will be more often, they will have plenty of invariant measures, so not just one, but for those which are sometimes called slowly chaotic systems, um, typically, so with probability one, if you pick one at random, they will be uniquely ergodic. I guess I don't have much time for the proof. Um, Maybe we can just prove one point in the last two minutes. Uh, 
Yeah, so just to have an idea of what techniques you could use to prove a statement like this, we can prove that one implies two. So, well, what you, well, you have to prove a statement for all points. So, one thing you can look at is fix any point and just look at the sequence of measure supported on the orbit of on some segment of the orbit of the point. So, okay, from zero to n minus one of the Dirac delta at tk of x. Is it clear this, uh, yeah, we've seen this already with Stefano. So you look at the sequence of points for all positive, for all the uh, natural number n. Well, we've, we've seen this is contained in the set of all uh, probability measure on x, maybe it was called p, I don't know. And uh, Stefano mentioned the set of probability measure is compact. So every time you have a sequence, there is a convergent subsequence. And, uh, well, the convergence and sequence, we've seen this in Stefano's class, again, has to be an invariant, well, it wasn't in Stefano, it was one of the exercises from Stefano's class, has to be an invariant measure for the transformation T. Any weak limit point of this set is an invariant measure. But how many choices do you have for an invariant measure, for a limit point? Just one. So can you have more than one limit point for this set? No. All the sequence has to converge by unique ergodicity, by definition of unique ergodicity. All the limit points have to be the invariant measure. So all the sequence, one over n, n minus one of delta tk of x. All the sequence have to converge weakly star to the only invariant measure because you have no other choices. And by definition of weak star convergence, then for all functions, for all continuous function f, well, when you integrate f with respect to this measure here, this converges to the integral of f with respect to the measure mu. And what is this integral on the left? Yes. Yes. The Birkhoff average. So a and f of x converges to the integral. So I think I missed one line from the statement, and the statement is so this is the statement, and if any of these solves, then this constant is the integral of f. Sorry, I haven't made then this constant is the integral of the function with respect to its only invariant measure. So this proved that one implies two and that this constant, uh, this is the CF. Any question? Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. <laughs>